Okay, thank you very much. And, um, so I'll continue where I left off. And as I said, um, most of what I'm lecturing about is in this preprint, which is not really a preprint yet. But if you send me an email, I'll save your name and uh, hopefully in a few weeks. Um, so, All right, so good. So let me, um, I'm going to continue uh, along the lines we were discussing. So let me remind you of some of the very basic things. So first, first of all, we, um, we studied the um, uh, Mura-Ori pattern. That's this pattern where the decreases are the dashed lines. Uh, the red lines are the, um, that consists of the locus of points such that sum of opposite angles is pi. That's necessary and sufficient for flat foldability. And, um, and, and, I, and then I, at some point I decided I would, I would make a parallelogram. Um, so there's the, uh, the result about uh, the uh, uh, folding of this pattern was that there's a parameter omega that goes from zero to pi, and there's also a choice of a plus or minus sign. So with the plus or minus, you get two different configurations. So we'll be we'll be using that in the second lecture. And uh, the reason for the parallelogram was so that we could make a, a you know a tile of a plane using the translation group. So remember, we have two groups. We have a group for the reference domain, and we have a group for the uh, deformed or partly deformed domain. And in this case, the group for the reference domain is just translation group with translations T1 and T2. So very good. And then uh, we did the following. We, we took two isometries, G1 and G2, and uh, we, we arranged the G1 maps this edge into this edge. Uh, I'm sorry, G2 does that. Uh, G1 maps this edge into this edge. And um, and then we took G one and, and applied it now. And it, so so this edge uh, is is reproduced over here in a not very good way, but I told you why it's my drawing. Um, and we designed G one. Yes, yeah, so G one is maps this edge into this edge. But we apply G one to the whole partly folded tile, and then we got this tile. And we take G two, we apply it to the whole tile, and we get this other tile. And then the beauty of these uh, of having a group of isometries is G1 times G2 fits perfectly, and this this group uh, builds the structure for you. So um, very convenient way for making complex origami structures. Then I was mentioning that you know as you build this structure, it can it, it can intersect itself and get very complicated and so forth. But um, and that's very much uh, that's. That's an issue of the discreteness of the group. So if you have two generators like this, um, and, um, and, and in fact, they're written in such a way that they commute. So these two generators commute, that's uh, written there. And then um, necessary and sufficient conditions that the group generated by these two, two generators uh, is discrete is, are these conditions. There exists. Um, integers p star and q star, so the m1 and m2 are there, such, such that this is satisfied. The theta1 and theta2 are angles. Uh, re recall that, wrote that r theta1 and r theta2 have the same axis, which is e, also in this notation. And uh, z is perpendicular to e. I guess I should have written everything down, but anyway, that's that's the situation. And um, if these conditions are satisfied, um, in fact, it's if and only if the group is discrete, and that means that when you you know you start applying the group to these partly deformed tiles, and uh, so this has um, also been parameterized by omega. Remember omega. Omega was one of the parameters. Is omega. So it's it's the parameter that. You know, helps you do the folding if you want. Um, so as you change, as you change omega, first of all, at omega equals zero, it's completely flat. As you change omega, these unit cells start deforming isometrically a little bit, 
And then as you continue changing omega, then you reach some omega star between zero and pi, strictly between zero and pi, and, and everything comes together perfectly because of the this greatness of the group. Okay, so that's uh, that's all stuff we described last time. So now we continue, and um, what you can notice is interesting thing is that um, um, first of all, what are what are the parameters that describe the unit cell? Um, you can you can you can choose as parameters the length of this edge and this angle eta. That would not be enough to um, describe the unit cell because you could elongate it in the horizontal direction and still have those two parameters. But there's also an invariance here, and that is that if you do dilatations of this uh, unit cell, then basically you get the same pattern. Uh, so if you if you factor in the fact the the the, 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 the situation the, the fact that you have dilatations, then you're you could describe all possible foldings with the two parameters, eta and L, and they're on these two axes. Um, so actually you can have phase, you can have phase diagram. So it makes a, a nice way to organize uh, your results, uh, just like material science. So material science uses phase diagrams. And um, and so in, in, and so in, in, in this phase diagram, the coloring denotes the number of solutions um, so there can there can be no solutions such as down here. This is a this is a higher resolution, but then you can have up to four solutions in this particular part of the phase, phase diagram. Um, there's actually two phase diagrams because remember it's this the choice of plus or minus, plus omega and minus omega. So the two phase diagrams are the same. This is the one with plus and the one. Well, it's a it's a nice way, like material science. In, in material science, phase diagrams are uh, are very standard way to organize results. For example, you could buy a book. I own this book um, on binary phase diagrams, and it lists all phase diagrams describing the um, phases you get by mixing two elements from the periodic table, any two elements from the periodic table. So it's like uh, whatever. 300 pages long or something like that. And um, um, and it, it, it tells you, so, the, so there's a diagram with some regions. It's like, a lot like, looks like this, and, and you know, in there's a phase in this region and so forth and so on. I'll tell you a little bit about the theory behind that in a, in a, in a minute. Um, Can I ask a question? What, what's that? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, you're speaking of the number of solutions, and somehow I forgot uh, solutions to what? Uh, yeah, so they're 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 um, they're folding arrangement. If they're if a solution would be would be this <laughs> this box. So that that would be considered a solution. So it, uh, um, it's a it's a function. It's really a function omega. Um, I, I mean, uh, it's a function which describes this process as a function of omega. Yeah. So it's the the entire process. Yeah. Can you dramatize the feet you talk about the D star, Q star, lambda, and sigma? Yeah, so um yes, so that's that's um <laughs> P star, okay. What's lambda? Okay, P star and Q star are in are these P star and Q star. So there are the conditions. I mean the, the you know the conditions for discreteness are that it exists P star and Q star. So um uh, and that concerns, you know, that that's something about the isometries because this P star and Q star are related to this M1, M2, and and uh, uh, theta one and theta two. So, yeah, um, yeah, that's a convenient way. So that's the same P star Q star, and uh, yeah. So you you would get to vary those as well. So. Okay, so and and what do I mean by number? Or here's a, here's an example of what I mean by the number of solutions. So here's a little part of the phase diagram. So it's this part over here, which is blown up version of this part right there. Um, and um, uh, and let's see. So um, you know, P 
A star, Q star have been chosen, and, um, and uh, yeah, from, um, now there's the plus or minus. So, uh, you know, that can be chosen independently. So when, when I'm, plus or minus count as one point on the, on the place that I bring. There's always a plus and a minus. So, um, so you call them monostable when, well, of course, there's, so of course, uh, a point on the phase diagram in a monostable region, so that would be a region, this light blue region, for example, would have also a choice of plus or minus. And you would get, you would get different uh, origami patterns in those two cases. So there's, a, there's two patterns. They're made with the same unit cell, uh, but um, you know they're, 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 they would have different diameters in general and so forth. But uh, they're counted as one solution in this in this notation. Um, so there's cases, and then actually, if you make these things, um, you know, typically you would have something like this since they're made with the same unit cell. Um, there's not there's no one parameter family which would take you from this state to this state. But often when you make these things, you can just brutally squish it and it, it, it does something maybe non-isometric or whatever. And, uh, and it certainly not given by this procedure, given by this, this group. And uh, you can actually go from this state to this state. You know? So it is actually possible physically to do that very often. Um, at least the ones I have on my desk uh, have this property. And everybody notices that. Um, so this is the bistable case again with the minus and the plus. Um, so so this would be considered two solutions. So this would come from the, this green region. And this, this is tristable, but it's going to be the minus. So I hope the notation is clear. It's just a notation, and um, and also there's even places uh, that are quad stable. Um, so that's four solutions that would be in this little region here. So you look at, so that's a kind of way to organize all the solutions in, in terms of a, a kind of simple diagram. Um, so naturally you would think of material science. I mean, um, and the, 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 the interesting mathematical problem is, are there qualitative features of this phase diagram or quantitative features of this phase diagram that you can discover, which would help you know about these uh, solutions you know that's and there are very you know there there are very standard things and there's a number of them the most famous one is gibbs phase rule um, that's a that's a rule a kind of topological rule about phase diagrams in in material science so you, think, you know i was mentioning those binary phase diagrams you would use gibbs phase rule to um, to to actually helps you construct the diagrams. It's a restriction on the diagrams. So it would be very nice to know for these origami diagrams. That's a sort of mathematical problem, right? Is uh, uh, not you know on, what are the what are the general restrictions on it? What what kind of thing what kind of regions can we have here, and how can they intersect, and so forth, and what's possible? Uh, so that's completely unknown, of course, because this is a, a new way to think about. Uh, or it hasn't been investigated way of thinking about the phase diagrams. Um, as I said, the most famous uh, rule in um, in uh, for phase diagrams in material science, compositional phase diagrams, would be the terminology. Um, and it could be it could be complicated. It could be not just a binary phase diagram, which is two elements. It could be something you can't represent by a picture. You know, it could be ten elements, and there's actually Major softwares which uh, try to feed, which give you some kind of approximation to the phase diagram. But it's they're competing softwares. But anyway, uh, it would be good to know um, rule if there's any rules that uh, should apply to phase diagrams for origami. For for materials, going back to compositional phase diagrams, as I said, the most famous is Gibbs phase rule. So if you don't know what Gibbs phase rule, it's it's essentially the simplest case. In the simplest case, you take an object, it has a geometric interpretation, very nice geometric interpretation. You take an object of arbitrary shape and you, you put it on the floor 
And, and the question is, how many points does it touch the floor? Um, and, and the answer is three. Of course, it's not three <laughs> because you can have a table and it's four. <laughs> of course, your table might uh, not. But uh, so the, the, then, then mathematicians have considered, uh, you know, what, what is really meant by that. So the generic answer is three. So in what in what mathematical sense is 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 an object sitting on the floor um, touching three points? And the the mathematical sense is the surface is smooth. I, I don't remember all the details, but the surface is smooth, and it and the um, the the number of points has to persist under smooth perturbations. And then the answer is three points. You know, so generically in that sense, it's uh, it's 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 three points. So maybe there are, um, you know, um, maybe there are analogs of this Gibbs phase rule. By the way, the material science um, um, problem, the mathematical problem in the material science case is, um, is it's a gap of it's, it's minimum of, um, and so there's some functions, new one of x, up to new n of x, those are the concentrations of the species in the phase that are represented in the phase diagram. I was discussing the case n equals two, and um, and the integral of new i of x dx over omega is uh, given for i equals one to n, and uh, you're minimizing the integral over omega of a function of new one of x. New n of x, and also temperature, which is just this constant scalar, is assigned. So it's that it's that calculus and variations problem, and it's um, it's been solved. I mean, actually, uh, the the, solu the rigorous solution of analysis of this um, of this uh, calculus and variations problem is the subject of Gero Frieziker's PhD thesis. So if you know Gero Frieziker, he solved that. As a function, as, as his PhD is. So, um, so anyway, yeah. So it would be interesting to to know, and maybe there are other kinds of representations like this that uh, we haven't thought of. Um, okay, so uh, I, I'll give you. I want to give you some examples of uh, of the group orbit method um, applied in different situations. So these are just some situations we worked out. Here's a situation when the unit cell looks like this. Um, in, fact, I, in fact, I think in this case, this curved line is a ruling, and this is a straight line over here. So, you know, there's some special features. I'm not telling all the details, but um, there's in in that paper I was mentioning. There's there's there are algorithms written out in, in detail of how these pictures were made. Um, anyway, this is uh, this this is flat. It doesn't look flat, but it's flat. This is not. And this is flat. So we're, we're using the translation group again in the reference domain. And uh, in, the, in the deformed domain, we're using the helical group of those helical groups. So this is a, the deformed unit cell, there's the helical group. And by choosing uh, different parameters, you can get all kinds of things like this. Um, you know, it's a choice choosing parameters and and uh, making sure the group is discrete and, and so forth. Just the standard procedure we've been discussing. Um, so now a, a, the answer to Luke's question is, is that, and the answer is I'm I was cheating in, in my discussion. So how do you, how do you fold these? How do you fold these? This is, this is how you fold these. So that's, that's uh, piecewise isometric uh, all, all the way along and then it comes, comes together. Um, so here's uh, this is a, here's another example. This is a case where this, this is the unit cell. Uh, this is a one-dimensional uh, translation group in the reference domain, and uh, a circle group in the deformed domain. Deformed unit cell. And so you're always designing these parameters so so you satisfy the conditions we we we've, we've been discussing. So there you can get some. Very nice diagrams here, and again, it's um, it's the folding process is uh, illustrated here. 
again, perfectly piecewise isometric, and it comes together perfectly in the end. Um, is that the equivalent of the parameter omega? Yes, omega is being varied. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then there's plus and minus. I don't. I don't think there's any plus or minus in these uh, plus one and minus one. Oh, there it is. You know, I'm not sure. I, I don't know what it's. Yeah, I was chosen. <laughs> um, so, so now, now, Luke, you understand because so this is actually, um, this is you make a cut here, and then it can be even even with the cut though it's not so obvious, but it it, it can be done. I don't have a movie of that case, but uh, so anyway, this is using the circle group in the reference domain and the circle group also in the deformed domain. When you do this, you have no idea what you're going to get. You know, but you you end up getting propellers and you know whatever. <laughs> um, here's an example with a 2D translation group in the reference domain and also a 2D translation group in the deformed domain. Um, this is flat. It doesn't, as I say, it doesn't look like it. And uh, but you use a translation group, and so the folding process in this case is is that. Yeah. Um, so then the, uh, this, there's an interesting, we started thinking, you know, what other groups could we possibly use? Um, we chose isometry groups because we knew that they would preserve isometries, even, um, you know, general isometries. Um, but we also realized that perhaps we could use conformal groups. Conformal groups are like isometry groups, but they have dilatation. So they have... Um, Rotation and translation, they also have dilatation. You might think in the, you know, you can't ever use dilatation because you can't stretch, you're not allowed to stretch the material, right? But you can use dilatation. And if you think think in the following way, um, yeah, so how do you reconcile dilatations with isometries? Um, and the way you do that is, is elasticity scaling. So the basic scaling law of, of elasticity theory um, is again, written in there is 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 listed here. So you have what you, what you first do is you you're not gonna, we're going to have unit cell, but but a, a neighboring unit cell is going to be a dilatation. So this is a dilatation of this unit cell. In other words, the neighboring the neighboring tile in the reference domain. So this is the reference domain. Let's say is. Um, Lambda omega plus c. So you 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 blow up omega and you're allowed to translate. So you could start with maybe this little unit cell, you blow it up, you translate, you blow it up, you translate. And um, and now to, for the deformed domain, you use this scaling law. So this is the standard scaling law of, of elasticity theory. In other words, if uh, if y of x and t even Satisfies the fully dynamic equations of nonlinear elasticity, you know, then without a body force, but a general material, then, then y sub lambda and x, x and d also satisfies those equations. In addition, it preserves the stress, it preserves the deformation gradient, so there's all kinds of things that, uh, that, so that's, you know, that would mean that. Um, in particular, as a very special case, if this if this little unit cell undergoes an isometric deformation and you use elasticity scaling, this one will also undergo isometric deformation. So that's a why not try those? That's 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 and since we have in mind that tiles are made or would be made out of some elastic material, this has implications about how we would even build such a thing. Um, but then we have to deal with conformal groups. So we have to figure out, you know, how do we generalize the uh, isometry is, isometry groups to conformal groups? So there's that's not just one way to do this. And actually, there's different group products you can use. We haven't figured out everything, but this this is just one way to do it. Um, it's naturally it fits in it fits into the pictures that we're, we're getting here. So what we do is. We make, instead of having isometries, we allow a dilatation lambda. And now we have to figure out um, everything that we, we figured out before. In other words, we have to figure out what is the group product we're going to use to figure out 
when is it discrete, um, and so forth and so on. You might worry that it's never discrete, and, and, and you'd be right. So we have to worry about that. <laughs> Um, but first thing is we're going to use the same group product before I, I, I guess I didn't write it down. Um, we, um, uh, we, we use the group product uh, lambda one q one c one times lambda two q two c two is. We just multiply lambda one, lambda two. I think there's other group products. You could do one with addition too, or you can make up some other things. I mean, we haven't investigated uh, all possibilities, but it, it goes like we do it. It's we're going to do it consistent with composition of mappings. So what we'll do then: uh, c one plus lambda one q one c uh, c two. So that's the group product. Okay, uh, now we're up and running. Now discrete, we have to work, work out discreteness. So that's an interesting story because uh, as you can imagine, if you're multiplying these lambdas, you, you're never gonna have discreteness. We'll see that more explicitly in a second. But you can, you can, you can think of what, you know, you, you could have really bad discreteness or you could have, you know, not so bad discreteness. Um, and, and, and in the not so bad case is, is semi discrete. So, um, you know, so we, we're, we're going to act uh, lambda q1 c1 on a point in, in R3 by, by just going, I says that comp composition of mapping. So we go lambda 1 q1 x plus c1. And that's our way of acting the, this, um, this group element on, uh, on R3. Now we take we take a point in R three. We take we take a, a group according to this product, and we apply this group to this point, and we get we may get accumulation points. Okay. Now we go to another point in R three. We apply the group. We may get some accumulation point. So so apply this to to all points in R three and collect all the all the accumulation points. Okay. So this is all accumulation points you get by applying the group to all points in R3, okay? Um, and um, we'll say that, that, that the group acting is, is semi-discrete if um, there's a minimum distance between all those accumulation points. Okay. So that's, uh, I mean, it still allows you quite bad situation of, of Nasty accumulation points, but semi discrete. But anyway, it turns out that can't that can't happen. Um, and it's, it, the theorem is if a conformal group is semi discrete, then it just has one accumulation point. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Um, dimension dependent. Yeah. Yeah, or the dimension dependent. Everything is uh, is in the dimensions here. Yeah. So I, I don't know. Yeah. Probably. Yeah, I, I have no idea. Yeah. So um, now let's take an abelian group. So let's continue. That, the result, the previous result was. General in terms of the group. Um, well, now let's take an abelian group with two generators. So there's our two generators. Um, and let's take them of this form. Um, the lambda is a positive, these eyes are rotations of polynomials, uh, EI, and so on. The um, and necessary and sufficient conditions for the group generated by V1 and G2 to be semi-discrete and abelian are that, uh, are that these conditions are satisfied and that there exists some integers P and Q that satisfy this, this condition. So this is a specialization to two generators. Uh, it's working out um, conditions for semi-discreteness. 
Okay, so that now that's so we we make sure that that's satisfied, and uh, now we have we have uh, because of this result, um, it just has one acute. So we expect to have one accumulation point with these two generators. We're going to make structures with these two generators. Okay, um, and these are so in the piecewise linear case, these are the kind of structures you get. So the, the accumulation point is obviously if you try to continue this, continue this, it's at the apex of this cone, so it's at the end of this thing. And uh, uh, so these are also made with those, we're, we're using tiles, which are the Mira Ori tiles. And, um, and, and you can, you know, you can satisfy, um, and, and they're generated in the same way previously. You know, you, you just take a, a, a tile and you take a, we have these two group elements. So you take a, a tile and you map to this group element, you map to this group element that is a dilatation. And again, the if you take G1 times G2, then you, then it fits perfectly. You know, same, same idea as before, it's same, same uh, concepts. So you can get various things. Uh, so this is, this blue and this red, that refers to um, this choice of plus or minus, which is um, also this, um, these, these, these blue would all, three of them would go down when you first start to fold it and the red one would go up. And in this case, the three would go down and the blue so um, it's, it just refers, it's a sort kind of pictorial representation of the choice of plus or minus in this uh, in this um, in this time. Um, so again, you can get various things. So this is there would be two choices here. So that would be the same crease pattern, but a, this would be a choice plus one, this would be a choice minus one. This again is the same crease pattern in four cases, but um, um, with this, that was re recall that this choice of, of the plus or minus is related geometrically to the mountain valley assignment. That's why I said that this goes down and these three go up when you when you first begin to fold it. Um, and similarly here, the mountain valley but assignments are represented by the blue and the red. Um, so, but in, in in this case, there 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 are two there are um, with the same mountain valley assignments, there are in fact two ways to um, to 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 fold it or to construct this uh, these patterns. Um, and here's another example. This is an example without using. So you can see the unit cell here is not uh, this simple mirror Hori pattern. This is a, um, a different pattern with a six-sided unit cell. And um, also, this is this is a famous pattern. It's called the water bomb pattern. <clears throat> um, and uh, at least some of these examples have a, a folding path, so allow you to go from the flat state continuously and, and fold. Okay, so okay, so that's um, that's the case with uh, piecewise linear. And now we can try to do the case with curved tiles. And uh, so again, we. Uh, we deform the tile according to the mapping and neighboring tiles. We use the rotations, the dilatations that are, are consistent with the choice of group elements. And I'm going to choose two group elements of this form. And, um, you know, and there's the restrictions on the parameters, the R's in SO3. And, um, and in fact, in, the, in, in all the pictures I'm going to show you, one is chosen to be a uh, no, it's, 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 it's just, we're going to take powers of this generator and we're going to take powers of, of the translation group for the reference domain. So um, there's the reference domain. Um, you can see the powers of the translation group and this, the deformed domains in various cases are, are shown here with different, with different reference domains. And so you get this, uh, 
I mean, we had, again, we had no idea what's going to come out of this thing. And uh, you get these things that look a bit like sea creatures, or they look like the horns of some you know, deer or whatever. And in fact, if you, I don't know if you know this famous book by Darcy Thompson, where he's trying to look at, uh, try to understand why all these forms that occur in nature. But you can see forms that are very much like the, the, the in Darcy Thompson's book, particularly ones which relate to sea creatures and horns. Um, <laughs> um, and probably this uh, group aspect has something to do with that in the sense that it does allow you somehow with a similar mechanism to grow from a small seed to a, to a larger structure just by uh, dilatating and growth, dilatating growth. So, so, but we haven't uh, explored any of these possible applications. So. Good. Um, so, um, and one more example I'll show you, which is not uh, which is not related to the normal groups, is is this example. This is an example we tried to do with uh, curved tile origami. I don't think this is drawn quite right because um, asymptotically. The sum of opposite angles is pi. So I think this has gotten distorted in some software. So asymptotically, it, it should be like the uh, piecewise linear origami um, you know, uh, structure. So, and clearly those, the sum of opposite angles is not equal pi there, so asymptotically anyway. So I'm, I'm not sure this is drawn exactly right. But anyway, um, I guess this has to be drawn right because you can see it. Um, and uh, so anyway, the unit cell, this is the priest pattern. The unit cell is, uh, you know, or the, um, the group chosen for the reference domain is the translation group, as you see here, and a helical group is chosen for the <coughs> domain. So you can do kind of mirror ori type things with uh, curved tiles. So, um, Oh, wow. so that's uh, that's. Um, I think I will. I think I will stop.